Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. All right, guys, I am your host, Butch Theory, here again this week. And before we jump into the report, we got a really cool opportunity for you. We have partnered with AFCO, and they are offering all of our listeners a free sun protection mask with any purchase of AFCO products. They make a ton of great products for all types of anglers. All you have to do to get the coupon code is text the word FISHING to 314-665-1767. Again, just text the word FISHING to 314-665-1767 to subscribe to our email list, and we'll send you the promo code via email. All right, guys, we have a great Alabama saltwater fishing report lined up for you this week. But first, let's take a few minutes to check out a few of this week's great sponsors. This week's Alabama saltwater fishing report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have AFCO, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five star Yamaha and Mercury mechanics. Also, if you're looking for a street legal electric golf cart, go check out their Atric golf carts. Sportsman's Marine on Highway 98, and they also have a downtown location next to Mr. Gene's Beans in Fairhope, Alabama. And also brought to you by Admiral Shellfish. Admiral oysters are available at select restaurants and can also be purchased by the public at Bon Secours Fisheries, Inc. and Ahi Seafood in Fairhope, Alabama. Call for availability. From a simple, nutrient-dense appetizer at home or a shucking party with friends, Admiral Oysters will steal the show. Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am your host, Butch Theory, and I'm joined with a special co-host today, Justin Fidalo with Saltwater Fanatics. Welcome to the show, Justin. Hey, Butch, man. Appreciate y'all having me on this week. I'm excited about this show. Yeah, man. What's going on? No problem. Yeah, we got a busy weekend, or you do anyways, for sure. Yeah, definitely, man. We're excited about that tournament coming up this weekend, and I think it's going to be... uh be pretty pretty good we've already got a bunch of people signed up i think it's going to look even better awesome man so first off let's just tell us a little bit about saltwater fanatics and kind of how y'all got to where you are today uh yeah so my name is justin fidel i was born and raised here on the coast kind of got this addiction down in destin on a charter boat and got more addicted when i got back um it's just always something different you catch out there you know sorry to hear that (laughs) i know it's a very expensive hobby it is and you definitely (laughs) go broke if you're not careful doing it but uh man so a few of my buddies we just got on there and made a facebook group and just kind of was cutting up back and forth and then it kind of blew up and we wanted to do something to give back to the fishermen and we decided to create a tournament that's built for the fishermen with a $25, you know, entry fee and prizes that are thousands of dollars. And we kind of pride ourselves on being one of the largest tournaments with the cheapest entry and the highest payouts. And uh, we've continued to do that, but we've also continued to be able to give back to the, the fisheries and um, different organizations, different groups. So we've been proud to help with different things. Uh, one of the biggest things that we help with is the live flounder turn in for the fisheries. The Alabama Marine Resources doing their breed stock program and hatching these fish and about 70 to 80 percent of the fish that comes from our tournament is in their brood stock right now so it's a lot of good a lot of good opportunities for people out there going to catch live flounder and bring them in we've got some great packages blakely at cca alabama gave us some really good packages that are totaling over about two grand uh in prizes and so uh, very nice one of the way to, one way to the win that yeah, is tell the, us a little bit more about uh, that like how does it work how do you get involved and in, in, uh how so you, accomplish you, that? you can sign up for the terminal fishing chaos uh to win one of these flounder packages uh, we've got a prize package for the most flounder turned in live and the random drawing so every live flounder you turn in you get one entry and if you bring us a live flounder under 12 inches you get two entries and every fish after that you still get the same amount of entries if you want to know how to catch those undersized live flounder you can get a special permit from us uh, scott van has signed off on it the alabama marine resources give us a special permit to catch undersized flounder now they have to be kept alive and brought into the tournament and handed over to the alabama marine resources you can't take them back with you once you bring them to the tournament and that's going to go in their brood stock so it's a really good opportunity we've got our uh, pro style redfish tournament going on this weekend it's a ten thousand dollar guaranteed first wow. place prize it's you know it's uh it's the only one on the alabama coast man all these other states have these things and um we're looking forward to it hopefully to bring something like that on the coast is going to be good it's a good opportunity i feel like and you, know, you know we still got almost ten thousand dollars in prizes and almost twenty thousand dollars in cash prizes this wow. this weekend so I think it's going to be a good time. We've already had more people signed up at this point than we have last last year, and we're looking forward to this. That's incredible, man. Uh, 
this is the i mean how long have you guys been doing this this is like the, yeah, the seventh annual and you're right looking back at some of these pictures where we started with dry erase boards and now <laughs> we got an led wall and um you know the measuring sticks we used the, the first term and the second term and now we've got official check it sticks um you know we, we try to keep the officials that, that are measuring the fish that are somebody that's knowing what they're doing and trustworthy um lauren j from the alabama marine resources is going to be measuring the fish with a check it stick and a slide and then we got john burke that's going to be weighing them and everybody knows john burke man that's one of the the good things about our tournament is we keep up the respect of it and we want to make sure it's a fair tournament and nobody's getting by with any cheating so yeah for sure we're looking forward to that and um you know i think it's just gonna be a good time so if folks want to get signed up, what's the best way to do that? Fish and Chaos. Go to fishandchaos.com. I mean, you've seen some of their stuff. You've oh, yeah. on the oh, show. Man, it's a game changer. Like you can go right there, get your ticket. It shows all the rules. You know, if you want to come and join us for the captain's meeting tomorrow night at uh, Ralph and Kaku's, we've got some really good cash cow cutters that'll be going on there. It's a live auction deal. Uh, it's a really good time. So even if you're not interested in getting into the live cow cutters, come and hang out. You know, everybody's there to have a good time. And it's just a, you know, all I say is it's a really good time tomorrow night. So just for clarification, we are recording on Wednesday. So this will be Thursday evening. That's correct. So yep. if you're listening to this, it's tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, correct. Correct. So yeah, Thursday night, so get 630. Dressed. Yeah, get, get dressed and, and and meet me down there. I'll be down there about 530, 5 o'clock. But uh, the captain's meeting won't start till around 7. But we ask you to get there at 630. That way you got time to get signed up and get all that stuff going on for us. Very cool, man. All right, Justin, man, it's been a long time since we've got a hatchery update from over there at Orange Beach, Alabama. Let's go see what Max Westendorf is up to, the uh, hatchery manager there. Welcome back to the show, Max. How are we doing today, bud? Doing well. How are y'all doing? Man, watching it rain. I know that's the seems to be the theme of the show the last month and a half is everybody trying to stay dry. How about you guys? Yeah, that's the same. We're waiting on it to pass, start doing our outside activities, but it's not doesn't look like there's a break anytime soon. I'm telling you, man, it's been wild. Just tell us about uh, Justin and I were just talking about the Saltwater Fanatics tournament this weekend and how involved he is in uh, collecting those flounders. So just kind of tell us a little bit about how that tournament helps you guys do what you do a little bit and, and kind of where we are over there and what you're seeing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been working on this flounder project, our uh, stock enhancement project, uh, since I got here in about 2017. Uh, and as we got going on the project, we found one of our biggest limiting factors to be fish. Uh, brood fish because you know for the his kind of rarity and we experience the same thing and trying to collect you know 50 60 70 live fish annually so we were trying to go out and catch them ourselves like we were you know going out trying to fish on our own we were setting gill nets for them we were drag trawls for them we actually went to the extent that kind of went on a theory that you know, those flounder migrate offshore during the spawning season, and we loaded up a boat and went out diving and trying to live collect them about 20 miles offshore at one point. Um, so we were going to, you know, some great extents to try and catch these fish. And then uh, we got introduced to Justin and Saltwater Fanatics, and they, they put together a, a live flounder uh, category for us where we could incentivize people bringing us live fish to add to our breeding stock, or, uh, breeding populations. Uh, and that first year was, you know, a grand slam for us because we were coming up with like a dozen fish a year. Um, and, you know, the Fanatics tournament in its first year came up with 40 plus fish for us in one wow. weekend. And for us, you know, that that's massive. We really only need, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten females a year. So if we're able to get that many fish from one tournament, now we need, you know, equal amounts of males. But we, we got some surplus and had a lot more fish to work with because, you know, we, they're very finicky. It's one of the harder fishes we've ever had to work with. They're temperamental. They're hard to get acclimated to the systems. You know, sometimes they just stop eating for no reason. They're, they've been a real challenge. And, you know, the more fish, the merrier. And ever since, I think every year we've collected anywhere from 45 to 60 fish with the exception of one really bad weather year. I think we caught a couple dozen uh, but it's pretty consistent that, to the point that we've actually shut down our own fishing efforts and solely, for the most part, solely rely on the Fanatics tournament. That's awesome. So you're letting the fishermen do what they do so, so you can allow you to do what you do. Man, that's yeah, awesome we, to hear, Max. I appreciate that. Absolutely. We always joke that, you know, we make decent biologists, but crappy fishermen. We spend <laughs> too right. much time studying it and not enough time out there looking for them. 
Well, I was just telling uh, Butch that Blakely just sent me over the packages, and man, he's got some killer packages again for the tournament this weekend. So hopefully, this weather moves out. It, the percentage of rain looks like it's down for this weekend. He's getting lower, it looks like. And so I think we're still going to have a pretty good turnout. Butch asked me, "Well, what's the what's the signups looking like?" And I, surprisingly, this year we've had more signed up as of now than we have in the past. Which so I still think it's going to be a good turnout. We got some really good prizes and some good sponsors this year. So I, hopefully, we'll collect those numbers up again for y'all this year. Awesome, man. We'll be there in our MRD Blues waiting on them. Sweet, man. That's right, man. So just kind of let's, uh, as far as the hatchery update goes, where are you in the cycle, I guess, is what I'm trying to ask. What's next and and kind of what what are, what are the founder doing right now and what are you guys trying to accomplish in the next, I don't know, six months or a year? We've had, last year was our best year yet that we actually exceeded our goals by, you know, what I would consider a long shot. Uh, we ended up producing about 123,000 fish. Uh, we had a little transporting air. We had a, a cooler tip over in the back of a truck while we were moving one. Uh, we ended up releasing about 112,000. And our annual goals are a little bit less than that. But that was that's it. Like, you know, we've kind of hit our stride with these fish and we're able to put out the, the amount of fish that we really want to. And we're actually, you know, we've been doing participate, participate in a lot of Gulf-wide, you know, flounder discussions and you know some of the the states are starting to come to us and us and ask for advice on how to do our stock enhancement program it's been such a such a success um but as of right now you know we're, we're still we're in the process of like fattening our our fish that we're our brood fish are they're in an artificial system we could give them a natural cycle because we just spawn them during the winter so right now they're kind of in a basically a, a summer period coming into fall we're manipulating that light and that temperature, and they don't eat that much during the summer for us. Uh, but this time of year, we start really making sure they're eating well. So when I say we're harvesting ponds, that we actually grow live shrimp in our ponds throughout the summer, and we harvest them this time of year, and we bring in live shrimp and start feeding them live shrimp on a, a day-to-day -day basis from here until December, essentially. So they'll eat everything that they possibly can hold and get really fat and happy until about January 1st. Um, and that's when we'll start our spawning procedure again. And then they'll probably be released come March of 2023. Man, that's incredible. That's really cool. So Justin and I got over there last year. About this time, we were doing a different tournament. We we're trying to get some water. That's the first time I've been ever to the facility and uh, incredible facility. But you were kind of telling us a little bit about it whenever we got the rundown. So the reason this is so difficult and so finicky is you can only do this once a year, right? Well, you theoretically you can do it, manipulate them to do it outside of season. But we try to, you know, you got to think about the fish that you're releasing. If they're naturally adapted uh, to be released in the winter time, you know, if you're sticking them out there, if you're sticking out a two inch fish in the middle of summer, you know, that's that's not a natural cycle for them. And it, and we don't know enough about these fish uh, to really feel confident about releasing them outside of their season. And there's something we're starting to look into as well. Uh, is that temperature actually plays a really big determining factor in the sex of these fish. Um, and there's a window from when they're somewhere around six centimeters. Uh, the, the exact window isn't determined. It's kind of between four centimeters and seven centimeters, somewhere in there, uh, where between stress and temperature, it actually de determines their sex. Um, so if you, you know, if you're releasing them in the summer, you could potentially produce a monosex population where you're not getting a 50-50 mix of males and females and we're overstocking one sex versus the other. Uh, so when you start releasing them out of season, uh, the answer is either you get them through that window at a certain temperature and try and get that 50-50 mix or you can release them and if you're raising them in the you know in their correct season, you can release them naturally and they'll get natural their sex will be naturally determined. Um, and holding them on holding on to them for longer has its implications. You know, there's mortality, there's costs involved. Sure. Uh, so we just haven't gone down that road yet. We got some experiments planned to, to kind of figure and hopefully narrow some of these questions or get some answers to them. But for now, we just kind of stick to our, our natural cycle. So Max, when you release these fish, how long does it take for me to be able to, to actually keep one? How long does it take for them to get to size to, to keep? I'd say if we released them, you know, January of 2023, you'd have a keeper fish by the summer of 2024. Oh, that's pretty quick. So, it, pretty you know, quick. it's, yeah, mm -hmm. they'll, I mean, those are, that'll be pushing that four, that 12, four, 13, 14, maybe a little bit longer, but you know, we, I always say there's athletes involved that even when you see them in our tanks, you'll have some fish that are almost four inches at release while other ones are hanging out around an inch and a half. So you're always going to have some fast growers in there and they're, you know, the top of that cohort will probably catch a bowl in a year and a half. Sure. 
Yeah, you're gonna always gonna have some freaks in there mixed in for sure. Always. Well, man, that's a very cool update, Max. We appreciate what you guys do over there, and uh, hopefully at the Saltwater Fanatics tournament this weekend, you guys can uh, re up your booty, get a get a whole new uh, stock in there. That's awesome, man. We appreciate you guys being on. Thanks for giving us the update. Absolutely, guys. We'll see y'all this weekend. Max, appreciate it, man. See y'all this weekend. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, Justin, let's head on down to get our first report of the day, man. Let's talk to Captain Patrick Garmson with Ugly Fishing. Welcome back to the show, Cap. How are we doing today? Oh, doing well, sir. Trying to find a dry place to let my raincoat drip dry. Hey, man. Nice. How's it going, man? Haven't seen you in a minute. What's up, Justin? Everything's well. Man, you got a big you got a big shindig coming up, huh? I know, man. I'm excited. I hope you see you and Cooper and Autumn this weekend. I'm sure you're going to come in with some heavy fish. I normally do. Yeah, I think Autumn's going to let the boys have it. So just going to be me and Coop. It'll All be right. fun. Yeah, I've been seeing some of those videos. Cooper's been hammering them. That boy is full of it right now, man. That's awesome. He's he is, mad at uh, I'd be a little more concerned about Cooper than Patrick at this point. <laughs> no doubt. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, the competition is should be fearing my son, not me. <laughs> <laughs> me and Butch were talking about how expensive it is. I hope he's got a good work, work ethic here. That little kid's going to go broke quick. <laughs> Yeah, well, he he's uh he's actually very conservative with his money, and he does have a good work ethic. So we'll see. Well, that's good. See man. He's how it all made it for sure. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you'll be borrowing money from him so you can keep fishing. <laughs> no doubt. Hey, that's that's a, that's not like a good plan. So it's a fish story, man. What you been up to? What you been chasing? Whenever the storms allow it. Man, this this is uh, I'm I'm kind of on a on a repeat record right now of just saying I've been just targeting what what presents itself go do things that are getting around, putting yourself in fishy areas and and um just look for life and and uh, man a lot of stuff uh, like the we've been catching some bull reds and jacks and the uh the ever popular snot sharks have been <laughs> All of those have been very aggressive on top water, and a lot of times we're actually seeing the uh, schools of redfish, or and I'm talking about bull reds, bulls, and uh, jack. You may just see them pushing wakes on these really calm uh, mornings, or even middle of the day if if you're not around some rain and it gets really calm. Those fish will get right on the surface and just start pushing a wake and. Man, there's nothing extremely exciting to see that and be able to kind of get an idea of where they're going and run the boat way up in front of them and shut down and let them come to you and um, get your anglers in position where they can make a cast and and uh, preferably top water. That way you get you get to enjoy watching the fish explode on the lure and everything. And it's oh uh, man, it's it's something to be something to get really excited about I, I you know i've had i've had some people kind of acting like they're turning their nose up in conversation about me being hard on these jacks right now and and man i just don't know that they i don't know if they've put themselves in position to see and you know and interact with jacks in the way that we've been doing it re- recently and and i've noticed some of these guys in the kayaks been doing it and stuff and man it's just so much fun and then on the other, like if if we're not seeing them waking like that, we're seeing them blowing up, getting that area where where we've seen them blow up and throwing top water for the most part has been effective. And there's been sometimes where the top water would just get them to come up and show themselves, and they wouldn't fully commit. And we could th- switch over and throw like a bucktail, like something you'd throw at a at a cobia or something. Uh, that that's been extremely effective as far as something to to get below the surface and something you can cast uh, you know you can just cast that dang there all the line off your reel with those big uh, wing jigs yeah and uh just swim that thing through the school and hang on that's the last video i put up a cooper that's what he was doing because we just the fish weren't committing to top water so we switched over to bucktail and he um he started catching them on that man that sounds fun um, it really is, and and it's you know, and the thing is, is if you tackle up a little bit to where you can catch these fish in three to five minutes, then um, it's uh, it's fun, you know. If it's, I can I can safely say that catching jacks becomes 
not fun when you hook it on too small a tackle and, <laughs> and you want to try to and you're and you're wanting to try to get your lure back. You know, you throw a you throw a, a ten dollar top water out there and, and a jack annihilates it and then you, you're like, Man, I want my lure back yeah. and it's forty five minutes <laughs> it's forty five <laughs> minutes later because your tackle's not big enough. That that's when jack fishing gets to be a little annoying, but for sure. But if you're prepared for them, it's just so much fun to be able to get in the boat in about five minutes or less and just do it again. No doubt, man. So I, I have been trying to be better lately whenever I get in my boat and trying to tackle, you know, whatever it may be that I'm after. I have a horrible ADD situation. I'll get up on plane and see some birds. I'm like, ooh, birds. And then I'll go this way. Ooh, those are the wrong kind of birds. Then I'll go over here. Ooh, a slick. You know, so I'm horrible about that. I'm trying to get better about it. Uh, the other day I came out of East Fowl and man, just a, I know you mentioned you were looking at for those jacks kind of pushing and the bull reds pushing pelicans mm-hmm. diving everywhere, which is usually, you know, indicative of, of pogies. Usually anything uh, else giving those fish away. Is that worth checking out? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you right around foul river right now, there's, there's just a, just a monster amount of rain minnows or small glass minnows. Mm. And if you watch the behavior, the, the way that the pelicans are diving, around foul river right now a lot of them are coming in real low and they're doing these low like scoops and they're not mm. coming in from real high diving down when they're coming when they when they get real high and they fold up and they make that big explosive splash that's usually when they're feeding on pogies and that's definitely worth fishing around when they're just light when they're just kind of like dipping down and getting those minnows usually if the jacks and redfish are feeding on those minnows, it's gonna be it's gonna be real noticeable. It's gonna be obvious because uh, they'll be cause they'll be blowing up in there. But one thing that I found one day last week is those pelicans were diving in in several different areas, and then there was I was just kind of just oh uh, just barely up on plane, just kind of easing along, and right in between the two uh, areas where the pe- pelicans were diving the most i see a big swirl and i stop the boat and i stop we started looking and a jack blows up and we throw out and we catch a couple jacks and they were dead in between where the pelicans were there was like no sign of bird activity where we ended up catching the jack i don't know that that's a that there's any tip involved in that other than that we were just being observant through that whole zone and if i hadn't a paid attention to that big fish swirl because once we got into where the pelicans were diving the only thing that we were having uh go at our top water lures were uh big lady fish man I, I you're talking about these jacks i still remember the first one i catch before i knew anything about anything i had a little fishing ski we were tied up in uh the industrial canal or we really mangrove fishing i'd toss one of my spinning reels out the back of the boat and reach down and eat a bite of my sandwich. And next thing I know, my spinning reel goes out the back of the boat. And I was no. like, what is that? <laughs> and so I had, all I had left at that point was a bait caster and I threw another bait out there. And next thing I know, I'll hook up on, I had no idea what it was. And so we pulled up the anchor real quick. My buddy's just driving me around chasing this fish down. So about 30, 45 minutes later, we figured out it was a Jack Carval. And man, I was super excited. Cause like you said, they fight great and everybody wants to fight one or two and, when you get that light tackle, it, it makes it a you little more less funner, but yeah. <laughs> what would be a good, you know, setup? Are you talking like 40, 50 pound braid or 30 pound braid or? So that's a good question. I like on, on most of my tackle, I like about 50 pound braid. 30 pound is, is, uh, is fine too, but really you want to try to put as much heat on these fish as you can. So 50 is, is a real sweet spot for me. It'll cast a good long ways you can put pretty much as much heat on the fish as you as you want to and you're not going to have a you're not going to have a line failure because of it and then if i'm using live bait i like a big like a seven alt or or bigger um circle hook and um but and then on the uh top waters i'm like in the been using some of these halco uh rooster poppers we talked about it a couple weeks ago swapping out the treble hooks for inline hooks Yep. Uh, making sure that those inline hooks are, are beefy enough. And then, and then Chris Vesche actually made the recommendation about putting the, uh, the tandem, like the, the, the like the butterfly jig hooks on there. Yep. And that's been pretty cool. Uh, that's been working out. Um, uh, one concern though, with doing that after I've, I've had that been using that setup 
is if the fish were to get the front hook and those and those tandem hooks go down in the fish's throat, it could get into the gills um, and potentially mm-hmm. kill the fish unnecessarily. But I haven't had that happen, and I mean the same thing can happen with treble hooks <clears> as well. But so far, everything that we've hooked on top water has been hooked really well, and those tandem hooks work work just as well as the single and um, and then also then those bucktail jigs. Uh, just making sure if you're buying one, it makes sure that it's got a showing off really strong hook. I've had, I bought some just kind of out of a almost an impulse buy at a tackle shop. I was like, oh, those look good. They're like two ounce or three ounce or whatever. And I didn't really pay attention to the hooks and the hooks weren't really strong enough. If you really put a lot of heat, you would bend those hooks out. I told you about shopping in the bargain bin, man. <laughs> you know, hey, I talk- can't help it. It runs in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about that top water catching the top water explosion, man, that that's really good. Like that's probably my favorite bite. Even Nothing it's, like it. Whether it's a, ba- a bus bait what it on is. bass fishing yeah. or you know, we caught those tuna this year with Kurt and uh man, those two hundred pound tuna hitting a big popper just <laughs> man, it's crazy. So oh any anything God. top water is just like uh, it's, the way to go. Yeah, it's 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 way better fishing than anything. So if you know so if anybody's ever had the chance to go get on that top water bite, I think that's the, the thing you would do it would probably change your mind. You'd never want to go fishing for anything else like that again. No doubt oh absolutely and that's i mean just the visual of it and like i tell people man i i can't tell you how many times i've gone top water fishing for trout or redfish or whatever and and you just get like you get in that in that in that bite where the fish are just blowing up and going crazy and it's like god dang man this is such an awesome bite and then when you like look back on how many fish you actually caught you're like well, we, we only caught like four, but I had about 65 <laughs> blow-ups. <laughs> no and, doubt. Uh, it's Worth like, it. It's like, man, but it was so awesome to watch the, you know, especially like when the trout get real fired up, they're flying out of the water and stuff and they were connecting. Yeah, man, it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. And that's, and, and we've been catching some trout on top water whenever I find the opportunity to, to do a little bit of that. But it, yeah, it's definitely a fun top water game right now for a lot of different species. Definitely, man. Uh, not necessarily top water, I guess, but I was up in Virginia a couple of weeks ago. I went to a ling tournament up there with my buddy Luke, and we were using a bunch of live pogies and uh, was kind of playing with hooking them in the back and then hooking them up through the nose or, excuse me, up through the, you know, both lips and then through their nostrils some. And we found that hooking them through the kind of between the tail and that first i guess that would be their dorsal and you throw it and kind of reel it and they would get on top and kind of skip dude i watched a cobia literally come from under that fish and he i guess it would be called the pile driver he literally (laughs) came up opened his mouth came up out of the water put his tail on top of his head and pile drive that pogey into the water one of the coolest (laughs) bites i've ever seen did you connect Oh yeah. Yeah, we got that one. Yeah, we got that one. Sweet. Well, man, what about oh, speckled trout? I know you awesome. just mentioned topwater a little bit, but what's going on with speckled trout world? You've been seeing any of those guys or you just been just avoiding them? Uh no, I've just been um, you know, if my customers are, are interested in trying to put some some fish in a the box, then then we'll start out I'll start out with some trout fishing and we've done some in top water, um, just getting around those schools of mullet and stuff. We uh and then and then a lot of what I've been kind of cycling in is just fishing the deep structure, fishing the rigs and fishing some of the reefs out in the bay. And most everything is seemingly more down towards the bottom, uh, live shrimp and croakers, uh, catching a few on pogies. But uh, uh, the deeper structure has been more productive for me, but just haven't done a whole lot of focusing on it. Uh, there's been, there's, there's some redfish, some, uh, like some of those upper slots uh, to kind of lower bull bull red classification fish, they're they're getting around some of these uh, near shore reefs and and stuff like that, or and uh, in the in near shore structures. So there's some red fish are starting to kind of show themselves in some different areas. But but no, as far as trout fishing is concerned, I really haven't been in the Mississippi Sound at all, and I've talked to some guys that 
when they are been, when they have been trout fishing in the last week or so, the, the sound seems to be a little bit more productive, especially with these last few mornings or last few uh, days we've had of with having that nice high water in the morning time. It sets up well for a good good early morning bite in those shallower regions. And uh, but that's that's kind of just more here hearsay information i haven't i haven't really been targeting them a whole lot over there you said this uh this the the deeper water structure is that because all the rain the fresh water is up on top and the salt water kind of pushes down to the bottom i man i don't i don't buy into that not when we get down once you get into the lower third of the bay i mean that water's still salty on top and uh, there's nothing that's going to really affect them from being on on top or in the in the middle or in on the bottom um, I think it's just more of a product of the just the time of the year. Even though the water temperature is way down for where it normally would be this time of year, it is still August and fish are still reacting as if it's August and doing kind of August things, being deep and holding a little tighter to the uh, to the bottom and to the structure. But but I have found that when the wa- when the water's not moving too fast around the deeper structure, you can you can free line some pogies or free line some shrimp and, and get some bites that way or croakers even just letting them swim all the way down through the water column. Uh, so Patrick, I think we've covered about everything in our tournament this weekend. Uh, what about triple tail? You know, we've got a category for triple tail, some great prizes, and we've got a cash cow cutter division. There's already a couple teams signed up for that and that going in this weekend. What about triple tail? I've been saying, I know we've seen a bunch offshore. I mean, they've been undersized, of course, all the ones we've seen, but I think there's been more I've seen offshore this year than have in the past. Well, so what about the inshore stuff? Inshore, been seeing a lot of them. Keepers, not not very successful there. I think we've had a couple that may have been keepers that that gave us the middle finger and swam off. Uh, <laughs> but the, the ones the ones that we've been able to get in the boat have all been have all been in that like 15 to like 17 and a half inch range. Stuck a, sticking a few tags in those guys, so maybe we'll get some get some data back on them when they when they grow up and get recaught. Uh, but as far as how we've been finding them, man, there's there's so much grass and debris coming down the rivers right now that once you get in the middle part of the bay and south, um, man, just slow down and take a look. Uh, there's grass patches out there. There's still several fads hanging around um they haven't been pulled up by shrimp boats or anything and there's that some of those are holding some fish some crab pots are holding fish i mean just a little bit of everything kind of all different types of triple tail structure seems to be holding them right now but as i mentioned it's kind of a it's you're not getting your eyes too dirty at least at least i haven't been and and the other people, the other guys that are that I talk to, there it doesn't sound like there's been a whole lot of keepers being caught right now. So hmm. maybe with the uh, with the with the moon, well, we got a new moon coming up. Um, a lot of times, those bigger fish will react to that. So you may see some may see some big ones show up this weekend. That'll be fun. For sure, man. I feel like it's that time. I feel like I feel like the big girls should kind of be here. I feel like you know first first couple of weeks of August into the first couple of weeks of September is whenever I've historically seen the bigger ones. Uh, I guess it feels like social media. You feel like, you know, you go in there and see five 20 pounders a day. I guess it's just always in your face. You feel like they're everywhere. Yeah. So to hear you say that's a little surprising, yeah. man, but I know you are talking about uh, you and Cooper fishing the saltwater fanatics tournament this weekend. Is there a kid's category, Justin? Tell us a little bit about that. There is a kid's category. So once again, that's just something we've always prided ourselves on is giving back and uh, kids 15 and under fish free. Nice. So if you um, get your kid out there, get fishing and um, you know, it's free. Patrick, is there any advice you could tell? I know you and Cooper are fishing this weekend. Cooper's always come in pretty heavy. So I know you can't give all your tips and trades out. Is there any tips that you could give? Like yeah, give so, us some, give us some sail cat uh tips. What you got? Where's the where are they where are them big uh, uh the big snot sharks? Yeah, snot shark tips. I've been sworn to secrecy. That's Cooper's <laughs> Cooper's hot. Uh that's his hot fish right now. He seems like every time he goes, he catches a, a six plus pounder now. Wow. And um yeah, but it's it's crazy that he does that, and I throw in the same spot, and I catch a three and a half pounder, and that's all I catch are the little bitty ones. So you got the hot, got the I hot hand. Know, 
Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna. That's my tip: is take Cooper fishing with you. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably the best. The best probably tip is to buy a ticket. Hey, I, I tell you what, you cannot win if you That's don't buy a ticket. And so, and man, there's it is comical when I when I talk to people that that are like fishing the same time as a as a as a tournament going on, not particularly yours, but just any tournament, and they go out and catch some catch some uh some good fish and then you hear you hear about them like on sunday they're like yeah man if i would have bought a ticket i would have won that category <laughs> well you it's know like, that, yeah you, you say that and there's been what two or three of the star redfish call at least two that i know of for sure so so that's another yeah. thing too that's going on right now through our tournament through labor day i believe is what mm -hmm. blakely was telling me yeah. so if you haven't signed up for that you know the, the redfish star tournament that you can win a boat and a motor it's a good opportunity you're gonna be fishing this weekend anyways and you know you never know what you you may come to the tournament with that that special special tag and walk away with a boat and motor from the cca so that's you know something to think about too just like patrick just said you know all these people talk about man if i'd have had a ticket and it's it's a proven fact there's been two i i, I thought maybe three but there's been at least two for sure that, for sure Somebody, if they'd have just bought their ticket, uh, they'd have had them a boat and a Man, motor. If you're going to be fishing now on Fishing Chaos, you yep. can literally do it on two fingers. You can, yeah. like, click purchase. <laughs> you're, you're there. If you're yep. going to be fishing, yeah. it's silly not yeah. to have one. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I mean, yeah, because even if you don't have a plan, like, if you're like, all right, well, I'm not planning to fish all weekend. Well, man, there's a, there's a lot of times where if you got that, you got a, a bite figured out whether it be speckled trout or redfish or triple tail or whatever and you got an idea where you can go catch some fish and you're only doing it for a short time man it'd be a heck of a lot better to have you a ticket to where if you did catch a really good one you run up there weigh it in and sit back and enjoy your beers and your weekend and if you and if you win you win you know yep. yeah no doubt. you don't have to you don't have to dedicate the whole weekend just because some of us, like me and Cooper, will be out there daylight to dark every day. But yeah, I mean, just because if, if you don't have time to dedicate the whole weekend, just and you are going, it it is kind of foolish not to not to participate. And, and you know, Patrick, one, of, one of the cool things this year, uh, uh, I don't know if you have a lithium battery in your boat, but Abyss Batteries gave us a $2,000 credit for every entry, like it's a registered entry. So if you're registered for the tournament, you have a random drawing to win that that cool battery from them um so that's another thing like you said if you want to drink oh, a beer wow. buy a ticket you know we got a, an awesome deal just buy a ticket and come hang out with us and see us you got a chance to win a two thousand dollar credit uh for a lithium battery yeah that's a pretty good roi that, that would make really the uh sweet. yeah that would make the lead acid to lithium conversion a lot less painful <laughs> a lot easier yep sure. <laughs> Well, Captain That's Patrick, right. we appreciate that report, man. Always good to hear from you. Good luck this weekend at the Fanatics Tournament. If folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in contact with you guys? Man, the easiest way is go to my website, uglyfishing.com. Click the book now button. Check my calendar. Still have some availability left for this month in September. October is totally booked up. November is going quick, uh, and then we've got some stuff available in December. And man, most of the people ask me about like, man, when's your favorite time to fish? Um, man, November, December are can be some of the most fun speckled trout times of the year for me. We go and throw in usually usually leaving the dock with all slick lures tied on, coming back with. You know, everybody might have one single color on because we found that cool beans or whatever is working better than something else that day and just going and catching and slamming some nice trout. And it usually lasts the whole month of December and then, you know, rolling into January, it'll continue. But yeah, if anybody's looking to, to uh, do some do some fishing this fall, uh, get, on, get on my books. And then I've also... If if October's the only time you can go, I've got some guys that are that are standing there waiting, ready to ready to take somebody that we're trying to uh, help fill out their schedule as well. So if you got any questions on that, then uh, give me a call or shoot me a text at two five one seven four seven one five five four. Awesome, buddy. Like I said, we appreciate the report and we always look forward to hearing from you next time, man. Good luck this weekend. You guys definitely be safe out there. All right, Butch. I appreciate you having me on. All right, Patrick. Thanks, man. We'll see y'all this weekend. Y'all be safe. Bye-bye.
All right, folks, that was a great inshore report from Captain Patrick Garmin with Ugly Fishing. You guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by AFTCO, American Fishing Tackle Company. AFTCO's fishing clothing is designed to handle the harshest elements. From cold tournament mornings to the humid summers of Florida, their products are built to handle the extreme. They're proud to hear customer stories about the 20-plus year-long life cycle of their AFTCO products. Their passion for the outdoors goes beyond their products. They're committed to protecting their fishing resources and angler rights. Through their 10% pledge to protect and conserve, your purchase of any AFTCO product directly supports conservation initiatives. Visit AFTCO.com. That's A-F-T-C-O dot com to learn more. And also brought to you by Richardoni Family Dentistry. Dr. Josh is a local dentist with 11 years of experience and is also an avid angler. He enjoys ripping lips as much as he enjoys making your smile perfect. At Richardoni Family Dentistry, they treat their patients like family and friends. They accept most dental insurances and see patients of all ages. Is your skin a little wrinkled from years of sun damage? Dr. Josh also offers cosmetic Botox. Don't let an achy tooth or a broken tooth from biting your fishing line too much keep you from a great day outdoors. Or if you just need a checkup, call them today at 251-342-6672 to book an appointment today. All right, man, let's head on down to get our second report of the day in lieu of the Fanatics tournament this weekend. We're going to keep it inshore, man. Let's uh, let's see what Captain Scott Kennedy's been up to, whistling waters. Welcome back to the show, Captain Scott. How we doing, buddy? What's up, guys? Appreciate you having me back on. I'm doing, doing great, doing great. Just kind of sitting here watching a, another wave of monsoon roll through. Man. It's definitely been the, the topic, really. Yeah. I think we've yeah. all discussed the rain here. Yeah. The last thing's like 40 days, 40 nights. It has not let up. It's been pretty wild, man. Oh, it's been crazy. Yeah, I mean, my my backyard, I'm I'm pretty sure I could release some fish in my backyard. And, <laughs> and they, it's it's definitely, uh, definitely made things interesting. But we're still, you know, still getting out, still doing the same thing, still catching fish. Um, you know, the, the rain definitely has kind of kept us bouncing around a lot. You know, I, I, I preach this. I know I've mentioned it several, several times in the past, and I always talk about people who are considering, you know, getting into kayak fishing. One thing we don't have the uh, the luxury to do in those kayaks, you know, if you got a storm coming up, like these little pop up storms and stuff we've been having, uh, we can't just really outrun it and go to another, you know, area. So we've kind of had to. I've been real, real picky, I guess, about where I've been been launching. You know, I hadn't been necessarily going to my some of my normal spots where I have to cover a lot of water and get away from the. You know, keeping it a little bit closer to the launch. If we do have one of these real nasty ones that's got lightning and stuff, you know, I've just so that's kind of changed up a little bit of what I've been doing. But for the most part, it's been been like I said, kind of the same old story. Um, for you know, all, most of the week, I've been in the kayak and um, kind of kind of how we've started things out most of those days is you know the first hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours of sunrise. We've been just getting after the Jack Creval again. And, um, you know, I, I said it last time and I'll say it every time I talk about Jack. Catching a Jack out of a kayak is, it is about as much fun as you can have, um, especially when you got them coming up, you know, right next to us. Uh, we've, we had a couple days this week where, um, I, and I guess it is the one saving grace about the rain, you know, keeping having that overcast, keeping the fish shallow. But we've had days where, I mean, we've literally gotten in the middle of these schools of Jack busting and, you know, having them eat topwater lures less than 10 feet away from the kayak just i mean one one of them in particular um we had one of my customers got you know uh kind of the tail end of last week it was probably honestly one of the all-time coolest things i have seen fishing on the water uh definitely the coolest top water bites i've ever seen i think it, it was 100 percent the coolest jack creval bite i've ever seen but i mean this thing it was probably a solid 20 to 22 pound jack I'm talking this fish. There was not a bit of it in the water. If, if you've ever seen the the video on Facebook of the the GTs, you know, across the, the ocean coming out chasing the seagulls, where they're just, I mean, just launching. This fish did the exact same thing chasing the top water, and uh, I mean, I, I was screaming at the top of my lungs because I was just so excited. <laughs> but it was, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's that's you know, that's what we've been doing the first couple of hours. You know, kind of kind of get you get the adrenaline running, wake you up real good, you know, get you a good fight where, where my customers out real early, you know, it's, 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 it's been a blast, but yeah, I mean, like I said, we've been throwing kind of, kind of switched it up a little bit this week. I, um, you know, I heard, I heard it was either, I, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, uh, Chris Vecce talking about switching over to the, the inline J hooks. Yep. I've actually done, I did that with all of my top orders that I used for jacks and, um, 
hadn't pulled a fish yet on them. And I've been a lot more comfortable grabbing that fish without treble hooks swinging around because, uh, that, that is, I've been a little gun shy. I got a, had a jet or a, I'm sorry, not a jack crowd, but a, a skip jack that decided to bury a, bury a treble hook in one of my fingers mm. last week. So I've been a little bit gun shy about that. Oh, um, so I decided to change out all my, all my top waters to those, <clears throat> uh, those inline hooks. I've been, been having, yeah, been, been having a lot of success, hadn't lost any fish, been having a lot of luck with it. So, so that would definitely, uh, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, as far as switching them out, that is, uh, that has been nice. A little, little bit more peace of mind grabbing those fish. For sure. I think that um, was, I think that was two weeks ago, and Captain Patrick was she, he gave the report just before you, and he was saying the same thing after Vichy said that he swapped over on the jacks, and he's been saying the same thing. So that's that's great to know. Glad you guys tested that out for us. Appreciate that. Yeah, that was a good point. Patrick yeah, was talking yeah, about I, that I, too. Yep. Chris, I he seems behind, to, um, Chris seems to know what he's talking about. Yeah, I'm a, yeah don't let him know that. His head will get bigger. Chris, uh, <laughs> If if Chris is talking, I'm I'm listening. Half the time I'm actually I record him just so I don't forget anything because that dude is he is a a wizard at everything, um, everything fishing. But but yeah, so I mean, you know, we've like I said, we've been getting after the jacks a little bit, kinda once the jacks have slowed down, you know, then we've been moving just back to the same old, same old, been going after hitting these kind of marshy creek, tidal creek areas, tidal rivers, um, just working for, for flounder and redfish been been kind of relying on the live bait a little bit more than i usually do uh, the past couple of weeks um just been using a lot of bull minnows shrimp shrimp worked well for us a few days uh but there's just there's so many catfish in the bay right now and so many pinfish and everything that you know for to use shrimp you better bring you know at least twice as many as you expect to to go through because they are getting picked off like crazy um but you know still still dealing with some some catfish on the bull minnows too, uh, but but have been having having pretty good success. You know, finding finding those flounder laid up right up against the grass. Pretty much every flounder I've caught the past week, two weeks, has been touching the the grass that's kind of flooded. I don't know if that's necessarily because I haven't really fished for them anywhere else. I've kind of you know the old saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So I've been been sticking towards the grass, um, and then you know kind of been going into it targeting flounder more so than than redfish and then getting the redfish you know kind of as bycatch but but still getting you know a healthy amount of redfish in the mix too um so it's been been good um hadn't hadn't really seen a whole lot of speckled trout action um again i also me might be because i'm not really fishing for them too hard right now i'm time i would normally be working towers for trout and stuff chasing the jacks around and once the sun gets up i'm just kind of Kind of had the flounder itch lately, so, so we've been flounder fishing and uh, been been having having success. Like I said, it you know it has been a little bit of a different week just because we've not necessarily been been able to fish everywhere exactly where I want to fish and everything. Um, but but we've still been able to kind of kind of roll with the punches and and um, find some fish in the mix. Scott, have you uh, you know we've got that big redfish tournament coming up. You know we guaranteed the ten ten grand for the first place. Is is there some been some good redfish being caught around this area? Yeah, I tell you, well, it's it's about fifty fifty. Um, you know, some of the ones I've been catching are just kind of kind of seem to be really skinny. Uh, but mm-hmm. but the other half of them I've gotten have been like the fattest redfish I've mm-hmm. I've ever seen in my life. So it it, it seems you know. What the biggest thing I've noticed is the fish that are kind of deeper in these tidal rivers and deeper in the creeks usually are the skinnier ones, but we have been, you know, finding those fatter ones out a little bit closer to the mouth. So I don't know if that's my mind playing tricks on me and me trying to, trying to make something out of nothing or if it, you know, if it is, it is truth, but you know, it might be, might be something to consider when you're, when you're fishing for that kind of money this weekend, because there is a, there's definitely a lot on the line for that one. Yeah, for sure, man. And those are th- those two right there are great tips in itself. But like Justin said, that's going to be a that's going to be a hot topic this weekend going into the Fanatics tournament. Any insider tips there? Like, what what would you be trying to do this weekend? Bait and kind of not necessarily the area, but what would you try and recreate? What would you look for this weekend if you were looking for the perfect redfish? Uh, so I try to find some kind of structure. Um, you know, whether it be kind of around you know, the mouth of a river or something, you know, somewhere that's kind of, kind of a shallower, shallower flat with, with deeper water nearby. And I would literally just, just soak bait all weekend. It would be 
not necessarily my favorite style of fishing, uh, but I would literally just have a bull minnow on a Carolina rig, and I would just hit every bit of structure I could, just picking it apart. And it's uh, like I said, it's, for some people, I know a lot of people enjoy that. Myself, I like to to work artificials and cover as much water as possible, making as many casts. So it would uh, <laughs> it would be tough for me, but but I mean, in the you know, haven't won anything, but gotten on a couple leader leader boards is is doing exactly that. Well, Scott, you said live bait. So in the pro, the pro redfish style uh, shootout, it's actually artificial only. So really? It is an well, artificial only. Oh, one. no kidding. Let's yeah, get that out of the way. Only, I, sure. only artificial only. Yeah, I um, had no idea. Yeah, man, we, we tried to do it so much, um, you know, as the pro style, you know, it, it's been tough. You know, I wondered why there's no pro style redfish tournaments on the coast. And, man, I'm kind of seeing it. You know, there's been a lot of guys that's called me up and say, hey, you got to tighten the boundaries up or you got to do this or we're not going to fish it because of this. And it's like – well, man, I'm, I'm kind of too late for this now, you know, um, you know, maybe next year, but you know, it, it's been tough to get some anglers for this and, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it seems like Alabama is the only one we can't seem to get one of these redfish things kicked off in. And, uh, I thought maybe the money would do it, but it's still been tough. We've got a few teams signed up. We're looking forward to it, but it is an artificial only deal. We Good just don't, know. we just don't have a blast off, uh, yet. And hopefully, if, you know, if it's successful this year, we want to pull it to a blast off style next year. Uh, we got a few ideas for it, uh, but we wanted to get it started. How, how do you enforce the artificial only? Man, so first place is a guaranteed polygraph. Like, um, you know, we've we've got the polygraph in, intact. Uh, the Neil will be there doing a polygraph on site uh, Sunday afternoon. You know, I, I hope that we don't have any issues with that. Uh, we haven't, knock on wood, we haven't had any issues in the past. Uh, not that we've caught and we've been pretty close. Um, we take pictures of any fish that are on the line. You know, any, any questions that come back? Um, so hopefully, hopefully the polygraph keeps that, uh, that intact. And I think most of these, the, the pro style guys are artificial only knock on wood. Uh, I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge pro style redfish guy. So I just been yeah. going off what I've been told. Yeah. No kidding. Well, I tell you, I, I know that that will probably save quite a few people. Cause I, I was, uh, up until me and my wife planned this trip to go to Cape Sand Blast, I was planning on fishing and I, <laughs> I guarantee you, I would have, uh, I would have had live bait with me. So yeah, that's definitely a good, good, good thing to keep in mind. But, but it does. I think honestly, I think that that levels the playing field tremendously. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I, I would agree. I, I agree with it a hundred percent. That's cool, man. I know last time you were on, it kind of, uh, kind of have an, I kind of had an epiphany. You mentioned flounder fishing. Scott's talking about, and it makes totally sense. It makes total sense. Like whenever you're fishing from a boat you know, you, you kind of nose up to a point or to a bank and you're casting as much as you can and picking the bank apart from the bank to you. Scott says he's so quiet that he can kind of get up in there on the, on the bank and cast yeah. parallel. Is that parallel? Parallel. Yeah. That's parallel on yep. both sides. And he works the whole bank this way instead of working it this way and that's why he's been so successful in a kayak i've always said it's crazy the guys on the bank are fishing towards the boat and <laughs> the then the guys right. on the boat are fishing towards the bank it's uh it's wild yeah so is that the same yep, thing you've yep, been doing finding I, success with those flounder uh just kind of that that same thing you know just sticking right up near the grass uh one thing i will say is i've kind of been trying to play the tides a little bit with it and it's worked out uh you know the past couple of days um, but I try to make sure that I save my flounder fishing for high tide. So if there's anything I can do, you know, to kind of burn some time, you know, like I said, go chase the jacks, whatever, until I can get all like as close to high tide for that first little bit of falling tide. Uh, that seems to be when I've got the most bites and had the most success lately. But just kind of doing the same old, same old, you know, just getting right up on those grass lines. Uh, the biggest difference this week compared to, you know, maybe two, three weeks ago is like I said, I am fishing a lot of live bait right now. So rather than, you know, just kind of bouncing with a with a fish bite or something or, you know, a gulp, just kind of bouncing the bottom back to me, I've just been slowly dragging that Carolina rig. So so basically, you know, as far as casting and setup and everything, it's, it's identical. Uh, just the biggest difference is now instead of, you know, sitting there hopping it and giving it some action, I'm, I'm basically just slowly reeling it back to me. Uh, just dragging that that weight across the bottom so a good falling tide is what you're looking for like as soon as it gets high and it starts to drop that's what you're seeing and i guess that's probably pulling that bait back off the bank yeah yeah and that's kind of been my thinking is you know once you get right there at the peak high tide and that water starts flowing back out you know those the bait fish are really having to 
to work extra hard to, you know, make sure they're staying in that grass. And then there's always those few that get swept out and then those fish are sitting right there. So I think, you know, I've caught them at, at all swings of the tide, uh, but that seems to be when I've had the most success, the most consistent success, I guess. Yeah. So last week on the show, we had Tanner, he's been doing a ton of uh, land-based stuff and Richard said the same exact thing. Both of them said the same thing, higher tide, the better. And you want to get that the highest. And then, you know, that, first hour of the falling tide in any kind of any kind of ditch or drain or any kind of anything that's tra- draining out so those fish are just sitting there ambush feeding so that definitely lines up with what those guys were saying last week yeah and i think yeah and i think that that's probably the biggest thing about it is I, I you know i think they're around feeding at all at all points throughout the tide but at least you know when it's falling draining just exactly like you said you know you kind of you kind of know the spots to go instead of having to work a lot of, you know, just kind of blind area. You know, you can you can visually see where you need to be fishing rather than just kind of, you know, picking apart grass lines until you find one. Yep, definitely makes sense, man. We appreciate the report. Those are some great tips for our listeners this weekend going into the tournament or just fishing in general. Um, if folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in contact with you, Scott? Yeah, so you can give me a call or a text at 251 408 2604 or you can check out the fishing chaos app under whistling waters or you can shoot me an email at kayaking.kennedy at gmail.com awesome buddy man please be safe you guys have a great trip this weekend and uh we'll talk to you soon yeah good luck down there scott thank you that was another great segment brought to you by captain scott kennedy with whistling waters kayak fishing and outdoors you guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's great sponsors that segment was brought to you by lnm marine l and Marine has something for everyone from small hunting boats, pontoon boats, to bigger bay boats and offshore hybrids. l and Marine LLC prides itself on its customer service and knows how important it is to have someone you can trust and to be taken care of. They are locally owned and regularly support the community. l and Marine provides superior customer service and has an entire team that consists of professional sales members, finance experts, service technicians, and a knowledgeable parts and accessory staff to support you. Go visit their friendly, reliable, and experienced staff now located only six miles north of I-10 at 34600 Highway 59 in Stapleton, Alabama, or give them a call at 251-937-1380. And also brought to you by Alabama Marine Resources. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers who harvest gray triggerfish, greater amberjack, or red snapper that their catch must be reported through snapper check. This includes vessels, kayaks, and shore anglers who possess any of these reef fish. Reporting is mandatory and must be done prior to landing fish in Alabama, regardless of where the fish were caught. Anglers can report to snapper check online at outdooralabama.com or through the official Outdoor AL app. For more information about snapper check or any of the 2021 fishing seasons please visit outdooralabama.com all right justin like we're talking about trying to keep it inshore this weekend we're going to talk to dylan keen i know he's been doing a ton of flounder fishing but he's also been offshore doing some uh some cool research stuff so we're going to talk to dylan keen over at the university of south alabama welcome back to the show dylan what you been up to buddy man butch happy to be here uh gosh i've been all over the world feel just trying to stay dry these past few days past three days been offshore all day every day uh trying to tag some amber tag that's been a fun experience um and then prior to that you know over the weekend and earlier this week i got the chance to do a little bit of fishing from shore around here uh kind of getting close to that transition time seeing a lot of uh cool stuff and doing a little beach fishing catching a few flounder here and there which should really only be getting better uh, as we get closer and closer to the fall but um before i get into the offshore stuff i just really like to give a shout out to my advisor sean powers and to the university of south alabama so dr powers uh just recently facilitated the opening of a new school at the university um the school of marine and environmental sciences which uh boasts both undergraduate and graduate level of education opportunities and everything from fisheries to physical chemical biological oceanographies shellfish marine mammals ecotoxicology all kinds of stuff and uh, obviously I'm a product of the PhD program there but we're really really lucky to have such a high level research institution like the University of South Alabama right here in our own backyard and they're uh, so involved with the local fisheries and to kind of build off that Dr. Powers and the University of South Alabama are leading a gulf-wide effort to estimate the total abundance of greater amberjack in the Gulf of Mexico very similar to what they did with the gray red snapper count 
And so it's a collaborative study among all the Gulf states that'll use six different gear types to try to estimate uh, abundance on these offshore habitats. But in order to make comparisons across these different gear types, you kind of need basically a calibration factor. And the way we're getting that is by utilizing the acoustic tags uh, and putting them in with a positioning system receiver array. So um, when you take these hydrophones and you place them in, in such a way that three or more overlap at all times with their detection range, you can actually triangulate in two-dimensional space where exactly an acoustically tagged fish is down to like less than a meter. Wow. And these acoustic tags we're using are like super fancy. So these ones have accelerometers and pressure sensors. So you can actually see where in three dimensions uh, within the water column these fish are. And um, what that's going to allow us to do is to run all these different gears at the same time with a known number of individuals and the known location of these individuals in relation to the reef and estimate abundance. And so uh, with that being said, we uh, basically nailed down two sites that we're working on and been out there the past four days attempting to tag as many amberjack as possible just on these two sites. Uh, so which means basically we're having to fish those same sites over and over uh, and essentially you get to the point where you're fishing these pressured fish and um, amberjack are very smart. They can be quite finicky, uh, especially after you catch a few. So we've been trying all sorts of different things to keep these fish biting. Uh, man, I have learned a lot. Um, probably the most important thing I would say quality, pristine live bait. They don't seem to want anything artificial right now, at least the fish we've been fishing. And so you really want a variety of these live baits, you know, small, medium, large, hard tails, sardines, uh, the Hayden, what they call the crazy fish, uh, cigar minnows, really anything you can catch and needs to be fresh. And so, yeah, it, it's really, really important to get these, you know, qu high quality, pristine baits hard tails of all sizes you kind of want to get some different sizes in there if you can too have been really good the sardines gulf menhaden which are the crazy fish the gar minnows so you want to invest a little i mean catching your own live bait out there uh, really makes a, a big difference hey dylan so these acoustic tags are tagging away they're not like the ones that are using on the uh cobia that actually have to surface to catch those the satellite signal Right. So yeah, those are satellite tags, um, oh, okay. spot satellite tags that'll ping a satellite every time that fish gets near the surface. These acoustic tags, you can program them kind of all different ways, um, but they put out a, a ping every, you know, however you program it for. These are every 20 seconds. And uh, on any of the receivers you have in the area will actually pick up that detection and log it uh, in their data. Very cool, man. I know I've, like you said, you know, going out on the escape and doing this, I've been I've been tagging fish with the sea lab since I was, I don't even know, five years old. I can remember going out on dad's boat with the big giant takes and swimming in the tank with the snapper because it was so hot that I could, couldn't get out of the tank. Yeah. So I've been, you know, back in the doc, doctor ship days and uh, very familiar with Dr. Powers and we appreciate all that you guys do over there. Yeah, really. You know, that's one of the, my biggest, the favorite things to do that come out of this tournament is meeting a lot of you guys and seeing all this tag and stuff happen and watching these tags get caught. And man, I, I'd say it to Max all the time. I don't feel like they get enough credit. No doubt. You know, you guys are out there busting your butts to, to make all this happen. And we're out there getting to, to reap the benefits of it. And uh, man, so I just want to take a minute to tell you, thank you for everything you do. And um, we enjoy having you at our tournament and we hope to continue to have y'all. So just thanks. And I, I really appreciate that. And, and we really appreciate you. The Fanatics tournament, I know for me, the past few years has been one of the absolute best tournaments that I sample all year. Um, it's where I see some of the biggest flounder that I see all year. And now what you, you know, what you've done collaborating with the, the hatchery and, and the state there to get these live flounder in for that brood stock has, has really made a huge difference, I feel like. And you're able to get the fishermen involved and that's, really really important and really awesome so we really appreciate you well dylan i appreciate that and like you said i want to make sure that it's the fishermen that's made this possible yeah i've, I've been able to make the connections and make make all the t's and dot the i's but if it, if it wasn't for these anglers and what i call fanatics you know the people that are addicted to this fishing it wouldn't it wouldn't be possible so 
you know, thank you for the thanks, but yeah, I got to give all these fishermen that come to this tournament well, to support it, me. Like Max was saying, it makes it possible on a much grander scale. I got to take, you know, the pressure off them and, uh, you know, the fanatics and the, and the ang- everyday anglers get to be able to be the ones to collect this data and collect these fish in order for Dylan and Max and those guys to do their job. And um, I think, I think that fishermen actually, they, once they get to see they're involved, oh, and, man. you know, when it's very cool. It's a bigger thing, you know? Yeah. When they take those flounder, put them in their big tank to head back, you know, seeing that, I think that's makes them feel important and kind of giving back in that aspect. So definitely. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to leave that conversation too soon. I definitely want to come back to keeping those flounder alive for the fanatics tournament. You know, like I was, I was saying about, you know, I've been tagging fish for a long time with the sea lab, you know, red snapper is the first thing that I can remember. We tagged them for 20 years. I don't know. It's been a long time doing the amberjack assessment. What do you think that means or could mean for our anglers in the upcoming future? Like what's the out, what, what do you think the best outcome for this study could be? I mean, ideally we get to a very reasonable, accurate estimate of the total abundance and we can, you know, move forward with important management decisions from there. But also, you know, very similar to Red Snapper, you know, these fish are very data limited, especially on a local level. And so it's really, really important that we know how many fish uh, are off the coast of Alabama. Louisiana knows how many fish are off their coast. And you can begin to manage your fishery a little bit better that way. And, um, you know, part of the, the issue is that the there's disagreement between what the fishermen see and what the federal stock assessments say. And so kind of bridging that gap and removing that discrepancy is, is how we move forward and get to a sustainable fishery that really benefits everybody. You get the fishery into a good state and then the fishery takes care of you as the angler. And so that kind of, you know, flounder is a great example of that. You know, everybody kind of came together and we changed management. We changed a lot of things. We started really putting, focus on those fish and we see the product of it. I mean, this has been one of the best years I've ever seen for, for floundering in my time. I mean, it seems like anytime I go out there, I can, and I want to target one, I can catch one. And so uh, hopefully it'll be the same way with Amberjack. You know, they have a pretty unique life history. They utilize like the sargassum and have a little pelagic stage when they're young. And then they get to these reef associated uh, stages and, you know, they're pretty fast growers and they move a lot, but we just, we really don't know enough about them and what their connectivity is and how much they move throughout the Gulf and stuff like that. So if we figure a lot of that information out, I think it'll really benefit everybody. Dylan, so I'm I'm jumping onto the flounder deal. We were talking to Max earlier about how hard it is to keep those flounder alive. Is there any tips that you can might give those anglers to, to bring those flounder in healthy in their live wells this weekend? So flounder do very, very well in the live well at least in my experience uh, working with Richard I mean he's got a ginormous live well but um, just keep him moving water through there and um, you know if you have any of the g-juice or any of the stuff that you know similar to keeping speckled trout alive or redfish flounder should be a little bit easier than that you know that's that's all to say if it's not gut hook gut, gut hook and flounder is about the only thing that you know will make it not do very hot uh, it seems like flounder in my experience have been pretty easy to keep alive and so that should be good for people. I mean, you can stack them up in the live well best you can, switch them into coolers, keep aeration in there, and you should be good to go. Yeah, I think right now the hardest part for us was always the water temperature water, issue. Water, warm, warm water. And I think that shouldn't be an issue this year, I wouldn't think. Well, uh, the issue we were having is we couldn't keep the water cool enough. The water was getting too hot, the water that we were getting from Max. and Oh, uh, okay. I got it, you. It I thought you were in the live wells. It, it would get too hot for us. And I, I think probably it would get too hot in the live wells, but we would just take some kind of like a, a jug that was frozen water and drop mm-hmm. into there. You don't want to mix that fresh water, but any kind of solid ice, you know, that doesn't. that's not going to leak into your cooler or your live well whatever you're using to keep those fish alive in kind of cools that temperature down. I mean, they seem, they seem to do better in cooler water than that hot water. Would you say that Dylan, that even, even the speckled trout? Yeah, definitely. That higher salinity, cooler water, they always seem to be uh, a little bit better off. I think, you know, maybe the oxygen sticks around a little bit better for them. Uh, They're able to get it out of the water a little easier. Man. So you mentioned, uh, we're talking about flounder here in particular, um, I know you'll be working the Fanatics tournament this weekend, so you will not be a competitor. Let's hear the goods, man. What would you be throwing this weekend, and what would you be kind of keyed on, keyed in on as far as what to fish around? We talked a little bit to uh, Patrick Garmison and Scott Kennedy, and Captain Scott was saying 
how, um, you know, he likes a really high tide and kind of, we talked about a couple of the, you know, the draining situations and some smaller tributaries and things like that. And flounder being ambush feeders. You got anything to add to that as far as tips on catching the old big flatty for this weekend's tournament? Man, first off, I am jealous of the anglers who get to fish this tournament. Uh, you know, when I end up wrapping up my research, I look forward to fishing it myself one day. But uh, I think Scott Kennedy definitely uh, hit the nail on the head there when talking about drains. So we've got a situation right now where we got these pretty high tides, and I think they should be somewhere around in the morning time this weekend. I'm not 100% sure on that. But we've also had a lot of rain, so... These high tides are going to really create high water situations. You should be able to access a lot of, you know, structures that may not always be accessible on a lower tide. And uh, what I would do is kind of plan my uh, approach around maybe the start of the falling tide. So try to find flooded access points, those creek mouths if you're in the marsh, uh, any kind of depression or drainage that creates even the slightest drop off will get those flounder a good ambush point to feed. And when you get that, uh, start of that falling tide that water will start rushing out of there that bait may come with it and those flounder be you know hopefully stacked up in there uh feeding but what also may be the case with all this fresh water is you may have to deal with a lot of muddy water if you're going to fish any of the tidal river parts in the northern part of the bay where these drains are so definitely stick with a good scented bait you can use your own scent whether it be the pro cure or uh anything like that or use a fish bites or a gulp and maintain that contact with the bottom. That's always the most important thing. Man, I, I'm not, I'm not much on the inshore stuff, but I have been seeing these fish bites just everywhere. And they, they jumped on board and was a sponsor for us this year. But man, it seems like a lot of people are getting hooked up on these fish, fish bite bites. clubs are working really well. Yep. Um, it, it seems, seems that, pretty, pretty good. That, that is a lethal bait, man. I've caught many fish on that dirty boxer and the butt kicker and all of it. I really enjoy throwing those. And, and another thing, you know, here around the island, the water quality and the clarity has actually been pretty good, uh, despite all the rain and runoff stuff. So that may be an area to try to uh, target some fish. I've been catching some fish off the beaches and stuff like that. What I call soft structure, you know, any kind of uh, depressions that are created by the sand or if you get any kind of uh, areas where it kind of backs into itself, little coves and whatnot that'll hold bait will also hold flounder. Uh, I got into a cool bite with the Bama beach bone not too long ago on a slack high tide walking the beaches. There were some schools of bait that the flounder were actually like following and sitting underneath. You could throw into that bait and get bit almost immediately wow. every yeah. single time. And there's, there's some quality fish, uh, uh, down there, down this way right now. I mean, you know, 18, 19, 20 inches starting to get real thick and, uh, we should start seeing some of these bigger fish. So something really, really cool that I'm working on right now has been, uh, assessing the offshore residency time, these big female southern flounder that do go offshore. And actually, what we're I've been working with these spear fishermen, sampling some of their tournaments, and they're catching, you know, big southern and gulf flounder. About a third of their catch is the southern flounder uh, oh. on these offshore reef habitats and stuff. And they're much, much older than what we see in any of the nearshore stuff. Hmm. And kind of what we're finding out now is maybe that these big females actually spend most of their time in offshore near shore habitat and then will come inshore like right now this time of year late late summer through the early part of the fall probably to feed or meet up with the other fish getting ready to head out and spawn you know they're about they're really feeding heavily during this time all the way through october to try to get all those nutrients allocated to reproduction so that they can you know they got a long journey offshore to spawn so really just a great time to think about targeting the flounder and if you can find that cleaner water absolutely uh, try to target that with some structured bottom whether it be shell uh, rocks depressions made by the beaches uh, and the sand and stuff like that very cool man very good tips if you were going to go for numbers of flounder as far as bait and location would it be any different than going for the lunker flounder bait and location Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. And so, you know, a lot of times there there are, you know, something we're seeing now that I haven't seen in years is these schools of flounder almost, you know. Uh, it definitely seems like, you know, when you get into that kind of bite, you can get a lot of fish, but they're generally all typically the same size, maybe in that 14 to 17 inch range. Um, but those lunkers definitely seem to be a little bit more solitary. You might find two or three of those big females hanging out 
uh, by themselves. And they generally seem to prefer uh, when, it, when, when you're not in like a drainage type situation, some pretty heavy current around deeper types of structure, I would say, uh, for those bigger fish. And I mean, I like throwing artificials all day as much as the next guy, but I'm not above throwing live baits for, for those big flounder, uh, setting up a Carolina rig with a short leader and, and some bigger finger maw loader pogies and, and kind of tail hooking them and getting them down there near those structures uh, where they start beating their tails and try to get back to the surface. That can a lot of times elicit those big fish bites. And even, you know, the rigs in the bay may be another uh, great thing to try uh, if you get in, into a slack tide type situation. Those those can hold some really, really big fish sometimes. Uh, Dylan, you know, one of the cool things that we do have in our tournament is a gig flounder jackpot. You know, with all this rain, is it going to be too muddy for that? I mean, we've got a couple of people signed up and I, I would imagine that's probably your heavy hitters that do it all the time. But uh, do you think it's going to be trouble with those guys? It could be, yeah. And what you might have to do is try to play the tide to where the tide cleans up the water a little bit. Hopefully, we can get you catch a break in this rain before the weekend. But uh, I, I haven't looked at the extended forecast. Yeah, it looks like it's getting better. It's not going to be beautiful, but it looks like it's the percentage. Like Definitely me and getting what you're better. Talking about yeah. it was went from like a seventy to I think down to like forty 50 something. Yeah, now. last I looked, it was like forty five something like that. So it's it's definitely getting better. And you know, I was telling Butch that we're we're in a lot better situation than we have in the past. Like normally, like we're sitting around like seventeen, eighteen people signed up, and I just looked, we're like seventy two. That's awesome, man. So yeah, it's uh it's pretty pretty awesome. I think it's going to be a, a good event again. We had, we had great numbers, you know, the year before COVID and uh COVID hit and it just kind of depleted us and um so hopefully we're we're back to the growing stage again people are more comfortable getting out and oh yeah definitely things are things are going better and so we're excited yeah it looks like you got a really good lineup bunch of really fun looking categories and jackpots and you got that pro style redfish division that's freaking cool yeah we're looking um, forward to that I, you know the only one on the coast and hopefully we get some good amount of numbers to sign up that we do it again next year yeah, so uh, and, and like you said, the it's cool that you got the gigging uh division for flounder. I think that's something that's unique to you guys and uh really draws in a, a another section of the flounder fishery. I think you uh, had not that everybody one, hooking. I think you had that one guy show up last year that had like some, 30 something and he let you sample every one of them. Huh. Was that was that yeah, last yeah, year or the year before? Uh, yeah, the Waldorf or uh Bruce yeah. Howell usually brings in a lot. So yeah, yeah I, I love working with guys. You know, they, they they get a unique view of the fishery every single day when they uh, get out there and do that. And so they care just as much as the next person about the fishery, um, despite what people may think about the giggers. Yeah, man, I'm I'm jealous of those giggers. I've been a few times. I've never been on a successful trip. I've never got to stick on. So I've never gigged a flounder. <laughs> fact. So, so see, there maybe we can make Dylan take us. That's the, right. That's what we us, need to do. Show us how to do it one night. Yep. Yeah, we can we can go for a walk. Uh, awesome. I don't have any of the fancy boats and stuff, but uh, maybe we can convince Jody or Bruce to take us. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man, that's an awesome report. That's some great tips for our guys going into the tournament this weekend, man. We appreciate all that you guys do. And uh, you guys go say hey to Dylan this weekend over there at the Saltwater Fanatics uh, weigh-in, man. We appreciate you being on. We look forward to hearing from you next time, buddy. All right, thanks. Oh, and one more thing. the uh, With the Amberjack stuff, there are going to be uh, reward tags out there. So that's any right. Amberjack you catch with the yellow tag, uh, are worth $250. All you got to do is uh, call the tag in, give a location uh, and a link on the fish and collect you a cash reward, try to get some of that money back. We know know how expensive fishing can be. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Dylan, I just want to, you know, give you another thank you and you and Max and Crystal and all those people that have participated in this tournament and helped make the fishery better. I just want you all to know that I really appreciate it. I would imagine the rest of the anglers are, are appreciating it too. Definitely. Thanks, man. It's something we're all really passionate about, and I I really look forward to seeing you this weekend. Look forward to seeing some beautiful flounders and uh, hanging out with you. Sounds great, man. We'll see you this weekend. All right, man. Thanks. All right, guys. It's always good to hear from Dylan Keene over at the University of South Alabama. That was a great segment. You guys check out a few of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by CCA Alabama. 30 special tagged redfish will be released inside Alabama coastal waters before the tournament starts on the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend and ends on Labor Day Monday for 101 days of angling. If CCA does not have a grand prize winner during the tournament, the grand prize will convert into a raffle for all registered anglers. Registration is only $75 and $40 for current CCA members. Sign up now at joincca.org slash star tournament. And also brought to you by... 
Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. The recent thunderstorms that have been producing wind and hail in the area may have damaged your home's roof. The Certified Roofing Pros at Foster Contracting offer free roof inspections, and if your roof has received damage, most homeowners will have little or no cost out of pocket when going through your insurance. If you're looking for quality construction with a dependable, licensed, and certified Fortified Roofing Professional, give the Fortified Roofing Pros a call at 251-973-9999. They're a family-owned business that is big enough to get the job done, but small enough to care. Remember to support the local businesses that make your local podcast possible and check them out at fortifiedroofingpros.com. All right, Justin, you know, we got to do what did you learn before we get out of here today, man? Did you pick up anything from today's show? When I think my biggest thing I picked up would probably be when Dylan said the live bait, you know, have variety, good quality live bait. Um, I always try to tell the people fishing with me, just make sure we catch enough bait. And what that number is, I still don't know today, but I know that the better the quality, I think, is what's going to be the ticket for a lot of people this weekend i definitely agree with you man i think that uh and people say i've heard definitely heard people say it here all the time skipper says it all the time take your time if it takes you an hour or two to catch live bait on the way out it's going to pay for itself in dividends and the fish that you catch in the long run leave leave earlier absolutely that's right leave what, earlier. what about you what'd you pick up so i was picking captains captain patrick spraying a little bit about the pelicans dive and whether it was worth you know worth my time to go over there and check out those pe- pelicans because i thought you know it was always pogies under them but he was saying that those I was saying not the, not the glass pen is a little red men is maybe is what he called mm-hmm. them. But the way those pelicans feed on them are different than the way they feed on those pogies. I just thought that was interesting. And that's indicative of, of different things that the fish underneath those men is underneath the birds are feeding on. Yeah. I, I thought those pelicans just crashed in the water. They're just so dumb. They're just so dumb. They just crashed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Agreed. All right, folks, that wraps up another great segment. You guys check out a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by United Bank. United Bank knows what an important role agriculture plays in our local economy. At United Bank, they are here to support local farmers with financial products and services designed specifically for agribusiness, including real loans for farmland, equipment loans, working lines of credit, and more. Truth is, they deeply value the contributions agriculture makes to our communities, and they help our local farmers build successful businesses. They want to see you succeed. Learn more at unitedbank.com or stop by any United Bank branch. United Bank, all loans subject to credit approval, equal housing opportunity lender, member FDIC. And also brought to you by Photonis Defense. Photonis Defense is proud to offer the PD Pro line of night vision systems. The PD Pro series is the world's smallest and lightest night vision goggles built around the Photonis 16 millimeter filmless 4G image intensifier tubes in their hybrid filmless 18 millimeter image intensifier tubes. These ultra light, ultra compact night vision systems deliver cleanest images, best resolution, smallest, most transparent halo and best overall performance and function of any night vision system available. The PDR Pro line consists of the PD Pro M 16 millimeter monocular, the PD Pro B 16 millimeter binocular, and the PD Pro Q panoramic night vision system. Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. Well, Justin, I appreciate you joining me today, man. I really enjoyed you co-hosting with me. It was a pleasure. Much I appreciate the opportunity. Looking forward to doing it again sometime. And uh, I hope everybody got some good information. And if y'all want to sign up on the tournament, fishingchaos.com. They'll get you fixed up. Heck yeah. You guys definitely go out and get involved in that tournament this weekend and uh, good luck. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please make sure and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to text the word fishing to 314-665-1767 to get that free AFCO sun protection mask promo code and also to be added to our email list. And we'll send you the new show each week. You guys keep whacking them. Be safe out there. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Hilton's Real-Time Navigator, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing chart since 2004. Your source for sea tips, altimetry, currents, and water color at hiltonsoffshore.com. Also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. And also brought to you by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. And also brought to you by Killer Dock. 
Killer Doc uses marine grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Doc combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit KillerDock.com to see more. And also brought to you by BoatersList.com. Do you own a company that needs to reach boaters, anglers, and marine enthusiasts? Sign up for free today to grow your business on BoatersList.com. Also brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. They offer high quality, easy to use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection. Also brought to you by Fish Bites. Whether you are hitting the sand with set rigs using the traditional scent strips for pompano or fishing the flats or marshes for speckled trout, redfish, and flounder, Fish Bites has something for you. Fish Bites baits and lures are made with pride in the sunshine state of the USA. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits at fishbites.com. And also brought to you by Test Calibration. Test Calibration is your source for sales and service of diesel turbochargers and fuel injection systems since 1976. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by me, Joe Baya, and National Land Realty. If I can help you in any way with the purchase or sale of land in Alabama or Florida, whether it's timberland, farmland, Recreational land like hunting land or even agricultural land or ranch land like horse farm. Drop me a message at jbaya at nationalland.com. That's J-B-A-Y-A at nationalland.com.